so welcome tonight in our third presentation in our STEM program series that is part of the Barnard Noyce Teacher Scholars Program and funded by NSF. Tonight we have the pleasure of hearing from Stephen Gilman, who is the founder and executive director of Makerspace, Makerstate rather. Stephen and his son Ben, who is also here tonight, started Maker State to bring fun steam building and learning projects in robotics, coding, game design, and more to kids in schools and communities. His company now runs over 80 school-based maker spaces in New York City. In addition to that, Mr. Gilman is the founding board, a founding board member of the Urban Assembly Maker Academy a founder of the Carnegie Learning Center, and a founding teacher and dean of Bronx Expeditionary Learning High School, which is now known as Bronx Collegiate. It's a public school based in outward bound experiential learning in New York City. He's a founding board member of the volunteer network Ulster Corps, and he's author of a book called Nightshade, which is a historical thriller detailing a 1702 conspiracy to control the Atlantic slave trade. Mr. Gilman's mission is to help transform K-12 education from lecture-based memorization to student-centered, inquiry-based experiential learning, empowering kids with life-transforming passions and creative masteries in 21st century skills. He's here tonight to talk to us about how STEM or STEAM makerspace programs can do just that, and how you might get one started in a school near you. So please help me in welcoming Stephen Gilman tonight. Thanks, Lisa. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Hi. Uh, well, thanks for having me tonight. and. Uh, being willing to talk a little bit about makerspace and STEM and coding learning in schools. Um, and I want to say my, I want to introduce uh, Ben and Laura back there um, and uh, joining me tonight. And uh, we're looking for a good Mexican restaurant to go to afterwards if uh, anybody knows of one uh, in the neighborhood. Um, and thanks, Lisa, for that uh, introduction. Um, we have, uh, I would probably say, first, you know, very humbly. Um, we started, I'm an old public school teacher and uh, started uh, teaching in, in a middle school in Harlem uh, many moons ago and, uh, and I've learned a lot of lessons over the years and uh, many of those lessons in how to teach kids and how kids learn uh, have come from a lot of mistakes and uh, in our program, it's called Maker State, it comes from the Maker Movement and uh, which is about 10 years old. Uh, that uh, that now Make Magazine and Maker Fair. How many people have heard of Maker Fair? Uh, yeah, just a handful. Um, it's still kind of on the rise. I mean, it's not a it's not a national phenomena yet. It ha hasn't had its Oprah moment yet. And uh, but uh, we're hoping that one day all schools um, have Maker Learning in them. So that's the topic of, of tonight's discussion. But I want to say, you know, speaking of Ben, Ben was in Maker States first makerspace program. I mean, we, we weren't even called Maker State, you know, those years ago. And he was young. Uh, we were doing, I think, Lego Robotics. Ben, honestly, how was that program, that first, that first one? Um, it honestly wasn't as great as it is now. Yeah, yeah, thanks. It, it was, we were doing, <laughs> we were doing robotics and, and coding, robotics and coding. And every day we'd build a new robot and, and code the robot with new functionality. And the program was like four times over enrolled, and we, you know, we were still trying to figure out, you know, the curriculum and that kind of thing. And it was a little hinky to say the least, but, but it was it was how we got started. And and since then we've had a, a nickname for Maker State called Make Mistakes, and you know it's what we ask our kids to do. And uh, so I would just encourage you, and from the very beginning of, of what we're going to talk about tonight, let's make some mistakes. And whether you're in the classroom or whether you're working with kids, that's a theme that uh, we really live by. And uh, don't wait um, is, is, is a big idea here. Dive in, 
and do something, start something now and make some mistakes on the way towards uh, really perfecting your, your maker and STEM and coding learning approach with kids. Uh, so here we see Seymour Papert. Anybody heard of Seymour Papert? It's another obscure guy. This is the human who decided first that kids ought to learn coding. And he, he posited that back in the 60s. And uh, they quickly learned that kids can't really learn coding by pulling up a command prompt on a screen and asking them to code something that they're not really going to see the immediate effect of even on that screen. So he came up with something he called the turtle. It was a robot that you could program that drew uh, shapes that the kids programmed into the computer. And uh, he wrote a book called Mindstorms, uh, which described that process. The Lego, the leading Lego robotics product today is called Mindstorms after uh, Seymour Papert's uh, book and uh, describing how to introduce STEM and coding to kids. And so he's an inspiration for us uh, and we're just taking an example from Seymour Papert and all those that have followed him uh, and very humbly, let's make some mistakes. So let's start off with, with, with some myth busting here. Uh, and let me ask another question. Who's heard of a makerspace? A makerspace, anybody? Okay, so most of us have heard what a makerspace is. Anybody can throw out their conception of what a makerspace is? What is a makerspace? Anybody have any, just one? One phrase or sentence on what a makerspace is. Ben knows. Anybody else? Yes. A space for invention. Right. A space for invention, definitely. And there are hundreds of makerspaces around uh, the country and around the world. And uh, almost all of them are for adults. And why? Well, uh, there's a metal bender and a drill press and uh, a 3D printer and a laser cutter and uh, there's probably some Red Bull and some beer in the fridge. It's a great place for, for folks like us to hang out and create and invent. But there's really not any type of program significantly, especially across schools, that are makerspaces in, in, in that vein. So the first, the first myth would be that makerspaces are just for adults. And what we're saying at Makerstate is that ma makerspaces are really for kids, right? Because if you wait until somebody's 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 to ask them to join a makerspace, then it's probably, honestly, too late. And I don't mean to you know, bum everybody out, but we know as educators that if you don't reach a kid by, say, the fourth grade in math and science, it's probably not going to happen for them. Sorry. And that's just statistics, right? That's what statistics tell us. Fourth and eighth grade exams, especially if you're, if you're not hitting the mark and you're not engaged, you haven't figured out a way to be engaged or somebody hasn't engaged you in math and science, that's not going to be your, it's not going to be your life pursuit uh, unless something extraordinary happens. So that's the first myth, first myth that we want to bust. The second one is that makerspaces are expensive and complicated. We don't need those 3D printers and metal benders and laser cutters. We do not need any of that stuff. And that stuff is very expensive and very hard to maintain and uh, it breaks down a lot and it needs a lot of TLC to keep it going and a lot of geeky adults you know like me maybe want to don't mind sitting in there and, and keeping this stuff going but really there is a choice that you have to make if you're going to run a makerspace as a teacher and that is are you going to teach 3D design or are you going to spend a bunch of time trying to get that 3D printer calibrated because that's what it's going to come down to if you get a 3D printer you're going to spend a lot of time trying to, 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 to work out two or three hour print jobs for one student's design, or are you going to teach those kids, um, 20 or 30 of them at a time, how to do 3D design and computer-aided design in something like Tinkercad or SketchUp? So I'm going to ask you, and <laughs> this is kind of like against the rules as far as a lot of makerspace people is, but forget all that equipment. Don't start with the equipment, start with the program, okay? And we're going to talk about exactly how to do that. Start with the program, start with kids making day one, right? And you can't do that with a lot of expensive equipment, especially if the school can't afford it. Um, let's see, a third and final myth is uh, you have to get permission. You have to get permission. Um, I don't ask for permission. Um, and uh, maybe that's one of the reasons why I'm not in the classroom anymore. Uh, you know, I would, if I thought something cool needed to happen for kids, I, I was not, the, the first person I went to was not my principal. Uh, the first person I went to was my colleagues, 
right? My fellow teachers, parents who I knew were expert at something, folks in the community who could help provide resources, even funding. And then when I got something going and I showed some interest and I could bring the principal by, I said, hey, take a look, what's going on? And they were like, whoa, okay, I give you permission to run the problem. Thank you, right? So that's the order you do it in. The myth, is, the myth that we want to dispel here is that you have to get this whole plan and make your plan and your budget and get everything ready and it's about physical materials. No, start small with the program with kids and uh, see what you can produce. It's probably going to be something magical. Uh, anybody heard of Daniel Pink? Uh, he's a pretty famous author these days, kind of a pop self-help business guru guy. Uh, he wrote a book called Drive. And in Drive, he lays out three principles that he says drive the human experience and motivate people in whatever they do. And if you don't have these three things, you're probably just going to be asleep at the switch. And you're going to be bored, disengaged, unempowered. But if you have a combination of these three things, you are living a life of ultimate joy. Right? So, again, this is some, these three things uh, adults find in maker spaces, we're trying to bring those to kids who are five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. Okay? So, are they learning in an independent way? And, and when they have a question, is the first thing that they do to raise their hand and ask you, it better not, because you don't know the answer. Right? And when I, I would have never got into teaching all those years ago, if, if I had all the answers. And one of my friends who was a public school teacher in New York City said, he, he told me this over and over. I used to sit at the pub and grade papers with him. And I wanted to be a teacher so bad. But I thought I had to know everything. And he told me over and over and over, you don't have to know it. You don't have to know the, every single thing about the subject. All you have to know how to do is get your kids engaged in it, right? And if you can do that, you're going to lead them to autonomy. Because when they have that question, they're not going to ask you. You're going to teach them how to find the answer themselves. All right, so autonomy is a goal here. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to fudge this and say it's not about the kids knowing certain things. This is not a room like an adult maker space where you wander into and there's all this equipment and materials and stuff and you can just start hacking and making and inventing and innovating. This not, it's not really... A, a true makerspace program where you can just do anything you want to. Sorry about all those Montessori folks. I love, I love that approach to learning, but I, we put kids in a room and when they walk out of that room, they know certain STEM skills and concepts and they have made something, whether it's a rocket or a computer program or a digital movie, that they can point to that thing that they made and say, I learned this concept when I made this thing in my hand. And that's what we do at Maker State, and that's what I think makerspace learning is. And finally, purpose. I got to be honest with you and say, it's not really about STEM or coding. That's what we teach, engineering design, coding, rocket science. Uh, but what it really is is about purpose. Um, are we giving kids a means to discover their future? Are we giving kids a means to develop their own identity? Uh, are we giving kids a way to identify the things in their world that they think need to be changed and empower them with the tools to change, to make those changes? And that's purpose. So whether we do that through any subject you're going to teach or through STEM and coding, that's the ultimate reason why I'm here as a teacher, is to develop purpose within our youth. Uh, should every school have a makerspace? I say every sh school should be a makerspace, right? So it doesn't happen in one room. It's not some corner of the library or some cool teacher who's just bleeding edge on everything and they got a makerspace. No, it's every single classroom. And we are hoping and expecting and planning and acting on a daily basis for the goal of every student everywhere in America learns by making. And we don't ask any kid in the United States to learn 
where they are not making something with their hands, collaborating with their peers, creating and finding joy and passion and purpose in that thing that they're making. That is school for us, okay? So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Two main, two main topics tonight is why. Why have a makerspace? Why, why, why pursue makerspace learning and STEM encoding learning? And then how you do it. So I'm going to give you the why and I'm going to give you the how, okay? Um, everybody knows the four C's, right? We're all pre-service teachers here, are we? Is that right? No, what are we, what are we, what are we learning? Yeah, okay, all right. And this is in what um, program, Lisa? Uh -huh. But this course is open to any, any undergraduate at Columbia. Okay. They're open to the public. Okay. Okay, very good. We've got some teachers here. And who else? What other majors? What other majors do we have? Uh, STEM majors. We've got what is it? Engineering majors, CS majors. What's that? Psychology. Psychology. There's a lot of psychology in what we're doing here. Any other majors? What else? Sociology. Sociology, great. Yes, yes. Anybody else? Econ, stuff. Economic statistics. Econ and math. math. Mechanical, engineering. Mechanical engineering. Great. Well, that's a great, uh, that's a great cross section of, uh, of, of learning there. Well, in, in, uh, so I, I, won't, I won't be so geeky on the teacher side of things, um, but really, you know, what this is really is it is about psychology. Um, it is about how humans learn and interact with each other, and that's really the essence of learning. So we can just, we can all exist in that space together, is how do we communicate with each other? How do we interact? How do we solve problems? Hi, hey, Andrew. Um, and uh, we believe that education has to have these so-called four C's. And if we are to teach kids how to learn in the classroom, they're going to have to learn to talk to each other and to collaborate in groups. They're going to have to get creative and think critically about complex topics on the way to solving problems, right? By the way, you know, this is the mandate of K-12 education or K-16 or K-19 you know, education or whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm not sure we're getting that job done. Uh, it gets me out of bed every morning to pursue that goal. Uh, and your Fortune 500 companies and every startup requires these skills as well, right? And is our K-16, uh, is the K-16 industry supplying graduates who are solid on these four C's? Um, well, let's keep talking. Uh, this is the makerspace at MIT. Uh, Makerstate was up there uh, last year doing a presentation with Scratch. The, the kids had created a, uh, a dance pad that uh, was a controller for a video game they created in Scratch Coding that was developed uh, very close to this makerspace on the MIT campus. Uh, how do they learn? Well, they, they have arrived at or are mastering the four C's themselves. Uh, this is a makerspace in Shenzhen, uh, China, where a lot of uh, leading edge microcontrollers especially are coming out of. One, one of our senior maker fellow instructors just went to Shenzhen doing research on uh, finding microcontrollers at a low price point uh, for uh, kids in our program. Uh, there, this is uh, the, the makerspace at NYU ITP and uh, just, just down the street. And uh, you'll notice in every, every one of these, people are not working in isolation. They are collaborating and doing something creative. Um, anybody recognize this building? Any guesses? Any guesses? This is, a, this is a company headquarters in Cupertino, California. It's, it's on the back of your iPhone, <laughs> right? This is the new, Ben, what, what is it? It's the Apple headquarters. It's the Apple headquarters in Cupertino, right? And this was the vision of Steve Jobs, and he didn't uh, see it realized physically before uh, he died. Uh, but uh, the original... <laughs> The original Apple headquarters was uh, rows and rows of uh, rectangular buildings. And uh, he worked in that space, and they got a lot of great things done there. Uh, but he envisioned a building that was circular. And why, w why would you make your company headquarters circular? Any ideas? Anybody? Why would you make it circular? Why make a circular office space? 
instead of a rectangular one, one long hallway down the middle and rows and rows of floors stacked on top of each other. Why make it circular? Anybody? Nothing more than that. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so Steve Jobs said they realized that, that when you can get the engineers talking, talking to the marketing people, talking to the data analytics department, that's when you create great products, right? And you've got to mash those things up. So you cannot go to work at Apple. You can't go to the bathroom at Apple unless you pass through another department. You can't get out of your car and walk to your desk unless you go through another department and meet other people. And you certainly can't create great products um, without collaboration. And they built a building, a company headquarters around that ethos. And uh, you, know, you might argue, unless you're a big Android fan, that it, that it works. Speaking of Android, Google, same thing. Well, let's create spaces that emphasize collaboration and togetherness. Uh, and play, honestly. And that's the way uh, humans learn best, and that's the work environment that we're going to create. Um, so in thinking about uh, what makes a good makerspace program, there's four principles that I want to share with you. Um, and uh, so, so if you're looking at a program, and you're gonna, if you, if you want to take a deeper dive on this, and I'm going to give you some things to look into towards the end of the, the, the presentation, uh, that, that you can learn more about how to start your own makerspace or how to support one in your community. But these are four things you want to look for. And there's a bunch, but these are my four. Um, is it student-centered? Now, it, in my view, if, if the classroom is not student-centered, I think you're going in the opposite direction. If the teacher is lecturing and the students are taking notes and they're you know, barfing it all out on a test on Friday or or a standardized test in June, and then they're going to forget everything that they memorized and go on to the next topic or you know, the next unit. Uh, that is, actually it's, it's, it is going in the opposite direction. You're, you are killing a human being's desire to learn at that point if, if, the, if, the, if the learning is not centered around uh, the kid and what they are doing. Uh, take for example Scratch. Um, anybody seen Scratch before? Scratch, right? Oh, a couple people. This is how we teach kids coding, and they drag and drop these color-coded blocks around the screen. And on the left-hand side of the screen in real time, they see a game or animation develop in real time. And we're over at PS191 with Andrew, and we're going to talk about Andrew in a Q&A uh, at the end here about Andrew's program at 191 and how we're using Scratch to teach third graders coding, right? So most, most human beings are not going to be asked to learn to code until their freshman year of college. Maybe now, maybe now, they're starting to do it in high school a little bit. 95% of the coding programs and makerspaces in the nation are at the high school level. And I am not going to wait that long, right? Because if that kid has gotten to middle or high school, and they don't think coding or engineering is for them, it's not going to happen. It's it just statistically. It could happen, but it's probably not going to happen. So we use Scratch. It's game-based, and the kids create games to learn coding. And, uh, but we, stop, we start first, you know, given that we're a makerspace, we start with physical coding blocks that kids manipulate on the table or on the whiteboard. And we brought a few. Ben's um, going to help us. If you could, maybe Ben, um, can you, every one for every two or three uh, folks here and with a, a, a whiteboard. Laura, could you help a little bit too? The, um, uh, so it, if then scratch blocks and these are, the, these are the scratch blocks we use. We have a few others and they're being used with a third and eighth and seventh graders at PS191. But we start with the physical coding blocks that look very much like uh, these coding blocks in Scratch, and we ask the kids to do certain things with them. Um, and there's a movement block for action, a repeat for loops, very important in computer programming, and you can have your character something, say something with this coding block. But the number one coding block in Scratch, pretty much, uh, 
and in, in, in our program too, is the conditional statement. It's it, AKA the if then statement. So if you're gonna program uh, a robot like Ben, what would be an example of an if then statement encoding? Uh, um, if touching color blue, then mo motion negative 10. That would just make us we couldn't go through the line. Okay, so if you've got a character that's negotiating a maze and they cut, they touch a certain color, back up to the beginning. Yeah. What's uh, another example, maybe? Uh, uh, if, if touching key, uh, if touching up arrow key, uh, move um, positive Y 10 spaces. Okay, right. That, that would allow you to move your character all around. Well, th thank you, Ben. That's a good one because he's gone from um, sort of concept in a game to actually an input and output there. So it's a physical input on your keyboard, output in your computer program. And those are two great examples, actually. Um, and uh, so what I'm asking you to do, you, you should have a dry erase marker with, with uh, your two or three uh, folks that you're sitting at there. I'm asking you to think of a game and a big majority of the, the things that we teach kids are through games. So if you could put your game hat on for a second here and think of that board game or card game or video game that you like. And then I'm going to ask you to create an if then statement. So um, if this condition, then this action. So if you could just brainstorm with your partner or the, or the two or three people you're sitting with, it could be a video game and it could be an input output like it could be game pad to what happens on screen or it could be a mechanic, a physical mechanic that happens in a board game. So some type of if then, if this happens, then that happens in a game. It looks like it looks like everybody's got one. Everybody's got an example. Anybody need a little bit more time? So right now I'm fascinated by uh, my if then is uh, what do you press to, to jump out of the helicopter in Ghost Recon, Ben? Uh, the, X. the X key, yeah. That's, a, that's one that's on my mind right now. because Ben showed me that one. Yeah, he, uh, when, he's, when he's playing this game, after his homework, of course, um, and uh, he wants to get from one town and the other in this open sandbox world, uh, somewhere in South America, I think it is, and uh, well, he'll, he'll get in a helicopter or a plane and fly there, but instead of landing in the next town where his destination was, you know, he's a pretty epic kid, so what does he do instead? You jump out of the helicopter or the plane and you, you free fall towards the destination. And then what do you do at the end? Um, I shoot the open parachute about 15 feet off the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's great. And uh, sometimes he can just land right inside the doorway. Sometimes he uh, makes a splat, but it's fun. Um, so if then. All right, so let's share a few more if then statements. Can we start over here? If then statement. What did you come up with? Oh, who else had that one? Oh, what? That's okay, hold them up if you did the Monopoly. <laughs> one of the most one, two, three, four, five. Uh, well, that'll make it quicker to get through these. Um, that's probably yeah. That's a classic if then uh, in game rules. Who else? Okay, if then. That's a conditional statement. What about you guys? Oh, right. And what did you come up with there? If you. Oh, right. That's a real life, a real life uh, conditional statement. That's a great one. Um, who else? Who else? Anybody else? That yes. Up arrow and jumping, classic. And we do that a lot in Scratch, you know, make that character jump over an obstacle. Uh, what's another one? Anybody else? Non Monopoly? Yeah. <coughs> okay, all right. Start climbing that ladder, Mario Brothers style, right? Uh, another, another popular game we make in Scratch. Anybody else with, a, with another one? A new one? Uh, Lord, you make one? Sure. Um, if I get hungry, insert food. 
Oh, yeah. I love that one. Ben's like, Ben, we were walking over here. He's like, you're always talking about Mexican food. But anyway, um, all right. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Um, so we teach kids coding, but we start first with something physical. I think that's an important aspect of what we're doing. But whatever it is, it's kid-centered. And you start with, for, for young kids especially, make it a game. If you contextualize it with a game that's related to their life, even better. Um, another standard is, will my child have an opportunity to work with others? Collaborate. And how do you help them with this? Well, and we're going to talk a little bit about more of the, uh, what game designers call the game mechanic. Uh, what is the mechanic that drives the learning process? Uh, well, uh, for us, it's getting kids into that zone where uh, the four C's are happening. Um, and it, that's communication and uh, collaboration, critical thinking, and uh, problem solving. Uh, and, and is that happening on a regular basis in your classroom? Um, then you've probably got, you're on your way or you are in a, uh, a makerspace setting. Um, how do you assess um, students' expertise? And, and this, by the way, is something that the education industry, as you probably know, is obsessed with this, obsessed with how you assess students. And, uh, you know, uh, George Bush II, or whatever you call him, he, he started, uh, what was his education policy called? No Child Left Behind, right? And then, um, and then Barack Obama came along, and he basically, I mean, race to the top, it's called. Race to the top, right? Um, and I call it race to the stop. Uh, you, we're going to introduce a assessment uh, mechanic because that's what it is. It's, the, it's how you play the game, right? And if you put a performance test in June that, that not only the students are being evaluated on, but the teachers are being evaluated on it too, and their pay is based on it, and their tenure and their status in the building and their reputation among their colleagues and even in their communities based on it, then that is what they will teach to. Right? So whether it's No Child Left Behind or Race to the Top, and that's, you know, like I said, that's one of the reasons why I'm not in the classroom anymore. And, you know, not, a, not in every instance, they, they didn't want me. And I'll, I'll be honest about that. They, it's, it's hard for a school to do this type of learning. It takes more planning, more collaboration, and I will say more commitment. Um, so how do we assess whether the kids are learning or not? We use the engineering design process, and it's, it's kind of mapped to the scientific method. I think you'll recognize the scientific methods. You know, you have an idea, hopefully it's in the form of a question. Uh, you formulate an experiment to test that question, you gather data, uh, and then you make some changes and do the whole test again. Well, engineers do the same thing when they're making software or hardware, and that's called the engineering design process or the design cycle. And it's kind of complicated, but we use this, and this is uh, uh, the design cycle as far as maker state is concerned, and we strip that, you know, nine steps down to three, because, you know, and we're working with six-year-olds. And we make a game out of it. So we've got four teams, red, pink, four teams. And the kids work in teams, and they work their way around the design cycle board. Um, so they're all going to get into the research and imagine um, where they look at a, some type of product that they want to design. They imagine what the possibilities are. They do a little bit of research about where it occurs in the world and who it affects. And here's a key step here is empathizing with that end user. They interview some experts or an end user if they can at the first stage here. And by the way, you don't have to do much as a six or eight or 10 year old to get to this first stage. You just have to start asking questions and interacting with your colleagues and bang, you're on the design cycle in the first stage. In the next stage, uh, the kids move to is design and prototype. They're gonna look at that problem or challenge in the world and they are going to design a prototype that addresses that challenge or maybe even solves it. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's how all products are made, basically. Not all products, I should say. A lot of the most innovative products are made these days. You know, you got uh, a minivan sliding door 
and you got a dad walking up with a baby in one hand and a grocery bag in the other, and there's no extra hand to fumble for the keys. So what do you do? Well, I don't have any extra hands, so I need a key fob that interacts with the door, and I can't even touch the key fob or the car, so I'll just kick my foot under the, under the driver's side, and the Bluetooth device will interact with that door and slide it open, and I start putting my stuff in. Well, they could not come up with an innovation like that, or a phone, or whatever it is, or an airplane. They can't do that unless they start with the end user first. And that's what we teach our kids to do when they're prototyping. In the next and final stage here, they play test. This is such a key part of design. Because in your classic K-12 classroom, the teacher gives you an assignment, you do the assignment, you give it back to your teacher, and you go on to the next assignment. At some point, at some, on some day, you get your test back or whatever it is, and it, it tells you a grade at the top. And over a period of years, that grade becomes your identity. Right? In this test-driven education industry. But what we're proposing instead is that the learning doesn't stop when you turn it in. That's where the learning really goes up to the next level. Because when you make that thing, you've got to play test it to see if it actually does what you said you thought it would do, right? And then that leads to gathering data and improving that product, right? And then when everybody gets through that final stage, um, they get into the team circle here. Wait a second. What if one team is left behind? Mm, that happens all the time in, in, in our schools, right? Not everybody learns at the same pace. And uh, eventually, you know, you go through enough days and weeks and months and semesters and years of being the kid who's the slower kid or the kid who just doesn't get it. And there's this other kid and he's on his way to AP classes. And there's this other kid and she's sitting over there and she doesn't think she can code because coding's not for girls. All right? What do you do about that kid? Well, you introduce a mechanic of learning that brings all the kids along together, right? So if, if the red team here, and this could be two partners or three or four kids, or a single kid, depending on how many students you have in the room, if they're not together, then this, these, this group cannot advance to the next stage, which is the team circle in the middle, right? And that, by the way, is a mechanic that happens at every stage of this process. You can't advance on to the next stage as a team unless everybody has gotten to that stage together, right? And you'd be like, wow, well, that kind of bogs down learning maybe a little bit. Not actually, because when, when these kids have figured it out and they've gotten to this stage, this stage, or this stage, whatever, then what we're asking them to do, and this is right, we're trying to remove the, the pole from teacher to student, teacher to student, teacher to student. Teacher's got all the answers, students have the questions, and the teacher just is like whack-a-mole. Right? And that's what K-12 education looks like today, right? But what we're saying instead is, you guys have gotten here, right? You've gotten to this stage, great. Now lift your eyes up and look across the room and see if there's any other students in the room who might not have gotten there. Maybe they need some help. Maybe you can get out of your chair and go collaborate with them to go share a best practice or share a wondering and help them get to the next stage. And we'll get there together, right? So we're removing that teacher to student poll and we're creating poles of learning between the students. And now the teacher is a mere facilitator and a guide going around the edge of the room and making sure this mechanic is working, right? They're no longer imparting knowledge. They are making sure that the mechanism of learning that, is, that we've created is happening, right? And by the way, again, this is what your Fortune 500 companies and startups alike are asking for. They don't need people who know stuff. They need people who can solve problems and work together and think out of the box, right? And that's what we've tried to create here. All right, here's the fourth uh, concept that is, is kind of a funny argument within education. A lot of people say, well, it's about process. It's, you know, whether it's art or learning or whatever it is, it's about what you do. And a lot of people say, well, hey, that doesn't matter if what you make is no good. And then the process people will say, it's about ideas and teaching people how to think. I agree. And the product people will say, listen, 
um, you know, we've got a limited amount of time and we, don't, we can't fool around on this. Um, so we got to make this thing. We got to meet the deadline. And a lot of people say, well, then you're just a drone. You're just a zombie at that point, right? So what have we done to sort of address that situation is create a design cycle that is all about process and product. People say it can't be done. And you're either in education, you're either on one side of that camp or the other. And you're, when you go into your school, they're going to say, what, 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 which are you? Are you a process person or are you about product? And you can tell them, I do both and watch, right? So this is a picture. It's a pretty good picture of a butterfly, right? Pretty good uh, drawing of a butterfly. It's better than I can do, right? Um, but uh, most kids can't draw this good. This is what, a, this is what your average six-year-old is going to draw if you ask him to draw a butterfly, right? Draw a butterfly, that's the assignment. This is art class or some type of art technique or whatever it is. They're going to draw the butterfly, right? Now, in most learning experiences, they say, okay, turn in the butterfly, we're going to go on to the next assignment. Isn't that a great butterfly? No, it's actually not a very good butterfly, right? That's kind of a, that's kind of a pretty sucky butterfly right there, right there. Um, this is, I believe, an eight-year-old student. Um, elementary age. So what we do at Maker State is say, that's a great butterfly, right? And we give them some feedback or ask them to, to seek the feedback of their peers in that playtesting process, and they draw another butterfly, all right? And they've added some more features based on expert feedback uh, or peer feedback or a reference that they sought in the room. And every time they draw that butterfly and iterate on that butterfly, they innovate on their design and improve it. And there it is, butterfly getting better and better and better. Because what are we doing actually in school? Are we just asking them to do rote exercises and then going on to the next thing? Or are we asking them to reach some level of true mastery where that thing that they created shows what they know? Right? And that's makerspace learning. So the same student who drew this is the same student who drew that first sucky butterfly, right? And this is what they came up with in that process of iterative design. Same student, growing skill set, going from zero to mastery. And by the way, that zero for us not only represents zero skill, but it, it represents zero interest. I don't, I don't want to draw a butterfly. I'm doing what you asked me to do coming into the building today. I've, I, I didn't come in with an intrinsic motivation to do this thing. And us figuring out ways to get them to draw that butterfly and learn the process of art or the skill of art in, in, on the way to it, well, that's the trick. You can do process and you can do mastery at the same time. That's makerspace learning. One student. By the way, that's an example um, from expeditionary learning. And uh, years ago, we started an expeditionary learning in the Bronx, uh, expeditionary learning high school in the Bronx. And, and I went from you know, lecture-based teacher education, teacher-based education to student-centered maker education in that school. And uh, so this is, I learned that sort of lesson well before I ever started my first makerspace. If we want to go a little bit deeper into assessment, then um, I'll tell you the true motivation uh, for, for why we exist. <clears throat> and it's about two, two uh, concepts in psychology, human psychology. This is really not education or engineering or computer science. This is psychology, right? And the first concept is flow. Uh, Hungarian uh, psychologist named Csikszentmihalyi came up with this, he coined this term, the flow, the flow state. And that is what athletes or artists, common to athletes or artists, but we say students too, they're in the zone. And they are so immersed in something that they're usually got their hands on that they're doing, they're doing this thing. They're so immersed in it that the rest of the world just kind of drops away and disappears. And they're finding passion and purpose and perhaps even new identity in that thing, right? That's the flow state. And, you know, it's our goal that that is synonymous with the maker state of learning. 
Uh, and a second psychological moment or dynamic that we seek at Maker State is the Fiero moment. Fiero is an Italian word for pride. And, oh, sorry. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Okay. Um, going back to the, um, the design circle thing, yeah. where like, one team can't move on. Uh -huh. What a great question. Those are tracks, right? They put the kids on tracks, yeah. right? Um, and, uh, you know, Ben's in fifth grade. I, I'm not about to let him, um, you know, get slowed down. For I mean, I'm going to be kind of rabid about that as a parent. So, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that we should not address that dynamic. But here's what you say to that parent, very simply. Is, is we can teach your kid what we're supposed to teach your kid, you know? And they're probably gonna learn it. And they're probably gonna forget it at some point. But if we can teach your kid well enough where they can teach it to another human being, they'll never forget it. Uh, is that good enough? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so one example of a project that where we're trying to find kids who come into the flow state and have that Fiero moment. And by the way, that Fiero uh, is, is Italian word for pride. And, uh, but it, what, it, what it really means in human psychology is it's that moment where you, you struggled and you failed, and then it's that aha moment. It's like, I did it. I, I got there. I, I, I was trying to do this thing, and I couldn't do it, couldn't do it. And then the Fiero moment is yes. And it's usually like your hands are up. And uh, I remember Ben and I were taking a workshop in a role-playing game design and, and, and making and he, sa he sat over this thing for an hour and couldn't get, connect the levels that he was designing and then finally when he you know, got a character to go into, what was it, he went into, one character went into the hut and what happened, I can't even remember. Right, and so he connected the levels and his hands literally went up in the air. It was a Fiero moment. We're trying to get kids there every day. So this is a product that we do where we're keep teaching kids a fundamental to electrical engineering, design process, and computer, computational thinking and computer science is the circuit, the basic circuit. And it's like uh, getting a kid to create a circuit with some of those kits that you see at Radio Shack and stuff like that, really hard, really kind of boring. But what if instead they could create a secret agent spy card that looked like a credit card or a driver's license on the outside, but when you opened it up, it had secret codes that they could use to communicate with their fellow students. And that was cool because they started doing the physical codes that is based on you know, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics and stuff that's been in, used by spies over the millennia even. And that's really cool because you get them building something and playing with something physical. And then you say, well, now we're going to make a circuit and you're going to do one more code. And this code is going to reveal who's on your spy team in the room by touching your card to theirs. And if when your card comes in proximity to theirs and it doesn't light up, that is not your spy team there, so you better watch out. And you talk about engaging kids from the first moment of learning and giving them something to be intrinsically motivated and super powered through an experience of learning. You know, creating a spy card is, is one way to do that. Looking for multiple even Fiero and Flow moments in a single classroom, give them this type of project to do. Uh, so let's get into how to get started. Okay, so we talked about the why and the the motivations for, for why we should get into this as educators or parents or community members, whatever it is. Let's talk about the how, okay? And I'm gonna try to, I, I told Lisa I thought we could get done a little bit early, so let's try to do that. Um, that. Is that clock right? The clock can't be right, is it? I hope not. 
Okay, good. All right. So let's get through the how a little bit quicker. Now, a lot of people say, in fact, you know, by a show of hands a few moments ago, not a lot of us are familiar with maker spaces or the maker movement. So this is how we start to dip our toe and get into this thing. Um, go to a maker event, the one at the public library or the, the, the World Maker Fair in Flushing in the fall, magnificent uh, event where you can see any kind of making activity from arc welding to 3D printing to uh, nano microcontroller robots, it's all there. And a lot of it's on fire and spinning around and it's just a lot of fun. And it's out there at New York Hall of Science. Uh, visit one of those things and, and, um, and you can get into, just see it and, and you'll, you'll sort of get the whole, you know, feel of it uh, and, and the why of it, why humans are interested in make, make, making. Uh, and you can enroll your child or your student in a, uh, a, uh, some type of maker program and we run after school programs, I'll, I'll tell you about that on uh, summer camps. But if you're really an educator or you're a community member that wants to see a makerspace and makerspace learning in your school or your community, I would suggest you host a pop-up. And a pop-up makerspace, and you can hold this in the cafeteria, here's a pop-up makerspace, where I said, I said, what do you need to, to, to host the, all I need is a bunch of cafeteria tables, okay? And I'll bring everything else there where the kids can build and learn. And this one, it was close to Mother's Day, so we had the kids create a light-up circuit uh, Mother's Day greeting card. And... Uh, Kids love doing it, of course. You can talk about building parent champions of your program. Uh, make some Mother's Day cards. So a pop-up is a great thing to do. If you want to dive a little deeper into learning about the maker movement and maker spaces and learning, these are some great resources here. Oh, by the way, I should have said, I see you guys take some, some, some note taking here. Uh, I want to share a, a, a ebook on that has a lot of this information in it with Lisa, and she can share it with you. The ebook covers uh, most of the topics in, in, this, in this presentation, in most cases in a little bit more detail. Um, and so these resources are in that ebook. Uh, so if you want to find out a little bit more, these are some, you know, Intel runs a program, uh, the New York Hall of Science itself, Maker Education is a national concern um, that does maker education. Um, organizations like Code.org, which Facebook and Microsoft are behind, uh, have uh, coding programs and STEM programs. There's hardware like um, little bits that circuits that snap together in a toy-like fashion that kids can learn that way. Um, so there's a bunch of different resources and they're, they're in that ebook. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how Maker, MakerState does it and uh, I didn't put all this up there for you to read. I'm just pointing you to our uh, website if if you're interested in starting a in-school or after-school makerspace, we have different levels, a club makerspace where you can kind of run it yourself, um, or a partner makerspace uh, where, where work, we're working in conjunction with you, and I'm going to talk about teacher residency programs in a bit. Our turnkey makerspace, we'll come in there and do the whole thing soup to nuts, and you don't have to lift a finger. You know, you just kind of let us in the room, and, uh, and we're there to, to make that maker learning happen with kids. We also do STEM summer camp, and uh, we, we have four locations of STEM summer camp around the, the city. One great thing about camp, a camp program, is it's, a, it's Monday through Friday usually. It's mostly all day, and you, know, you get more time with the kids, and they can slow down a little bit and do pro a whole project in the morning, a whole project in the afternoon, a culminating project um, for the end of the week usually. And this is what a typical day, this is what the whiteboard looks like when you walk into STEM camp. Um, this is what we're going to do in the morning, and um, these are some keywords that we're going to dive into, algorithms and storyboards, um, and uh, these are some things that uh, we're going to build. Uh, remote control sumo robot, a Pixton comic book, uh, and a bunch of different hands-on um, learning that kids get into on a daily basis in camp. By the way, for the first time we ran, I think, Nearly all of the homeless shelter education programs in the Bronx, we ran all makerspaces in all of them this past summer. And that's really getting to our true mission uh, of serving kids in the greatest need. And, and Andrew's going to talk about that, update you uh, from, from his talk, uh, was it last year? Yeah, yeah, uh, in, a, in a little bit. Um, we're part of the CS for All initiative. This is Mayor de Blasio's, uh, when he, he just ran re-election. 
and the single highest priority, the greatest priority he had in running again for mayor was education. And he said, I'm asking you to hire me again as the leader of the greatest city in the world, and I have one priority, and that is to improve education for our kids. Right? And one of his main programs to do that, CS for All, computer science for every student in every public school by the year 2025. And we are a provider of coding education for the CS for All initiative and training hundreds and eventually thousands of teachers in New York City to, to teach their kid co kids coding in hands-on ways. Oh, I had a little video to show. Um, let's see. I'll pull this up. Um, I, I, th I thought I was going to be giving this on my computer, but um, let's see. So it's pulled up on there, but um, let's see. Shows you the stuff that I watched there. Let me see. Um, Oh, I see. Sorry. I think this is. <coughs> oh boy, that's not it either. Um, hmm. Let me see. Uh, if I have a link in here somewhere. I think, yeah, there it is. Thank you, Laura. The city of New York has set an ambitious goal. Every student will learn computer science. By the year 2025, the DOE will train nearly 5,000 teachers who will bring CS education to the city's 1.1 million public school students. CS for All Professional Development Partner, MakerState, is training teachers to teach coding through student program games they can play and share, and their student-coded apps that can change their world. It's engagement-first, project-based coding education. So uh, CS for All is an exciting initiative and uh, that's ongoing uh, year by year and until we get to every school, every kid, every level, elementary, middle school, and high school has, has this opportunity. And uh, so that we're training teachers at that point, not as much working directly with kids. Um, and that's just one of the things that we're doing. Another uh, program that we're doing is teacher residencies and PS191 will be an example of that. We're working in a year-long program of a teacher residency where one of our senior maker fellow instructors is working with a, with a teacher or a group of teachers to deliver the program and the teacher learns kind of on the job training style uh, along with the kids and it works really great because the teacher is like, hey, I'm really good at like earth science and math or, or English or whatever, I don't really know coding. But here again, there's that magic, magic thing. 
is you don't have to know it to teach it. You just have to be willing to dive into it with your students. And it is recommended that you try to stay a step or two ahead of them in, in the things that you're going to present. Um, but the teacher residencies is a way to, that you can, uh, can, can do that. Um, we're, we're in uh, about 80 school programs uh, across mostly New York City. And they all look something different, like PS87, after school program, Success Academy. Parents, uh, Success Academy doesn't allow third parties to operate inside their buildings. So the parents uh, got a space and said, Maker State, come on in, create a makerspace program. We did robotics and coding with them for a couple years. Uh, PS199, parent Karen Cape. Uh, um, it, talked to the principal when we started doing an after school program and eventually we were doing summer camp there um, and Andrew Chu who's with us uh, here is uh, at PS 191 and I, I wanted to um, introduce Andrew and now I don't know if it was anybody at the STEM colloquium when Andrew spoke was it a year ago and uh, yes yeah, so it was almost a year ago I think that, that, that Andrew spoke and Andrew, we, we want to we do a Q&A at the end of this, and so Andrew can be available to, to answer questions from the perspective of a parent, advocate, and somebody who has uh, you know, actually been instrumental in creating the program. But Andrew, what's a snapshot of, of basically what, what you went from? You went from zero, like nobody knows anything really about makerspace learning, to, to the program that we have today where many, many kids are learning coding in a makerspace setting. How, how do you do it? Um, it's a good question. I mean, so uh, I think one thing is, uh, you know, our school is actually in somewhat of a unique situation. So not to get into the whole kind of context, but we had a pretty controversial rezoning like two or three years ago, which actually involved one of the other schools up there, PS 199. And long story short, coming out of that, PS 191, um, it's very interesting. 199 and 191 are probably about nine blocks apart, but in terms of the demographic makeup of the schools, the history of the schools, they couldn't be further apart. Um, you know, PS 199 is probably, arguably, if you look at the numbers, one of the best public <coughs> elementary schools um, in Manhattan. And PS 191, I think, historically um, has been underserved, and again, if you look at the numbers, underperforming. Um, you know, it's historically had above 80 or 90 percent low income. Um, you know, students. And the really, I think, kind of surprising thing is both of those schools are uh, in Lincoln Center. So in an area we wouldn't typically, typically think that there'd be such diversity um, of education within, again, 10 square blocks. So coming out of the rezoning, I think there was a very unique opportunity because I think a lot of people at this point in time are trying to put their minds together to see if there's a way to solve for that. So. Mayor de Blasio, for, for instance, and that's kind of trickled down, they have a focus on education, but the question's always been, how do you solve for, you know, school segregation? I mean, effectively is what, is what it is. Um, and, uh, you know, I think with that as kind of the backdrop and the context, I think people were willing to kind of think out of the box. Um, a lot of the things that Stephen spoke to in terms of, like, these regimented kind of, um, you know, kind of protocols that are really baked and ingrained in our educational system, here was a chance where basically people didn't have anything to lose. Like, we were willing to just try something different, try something new. And when you have enough of those constituents that are willing, have gotten to the point that, hey, you know, we might as well try something, it gives you actually that opportunity to really kind of push and do something that, um, you know, is, is kind of unprecedented, right? So, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to come in uh, about a year and a half ago, and it's, again, it's multiple parties. The principal has been really awesome, Principal uh, Lauren Kebbell. The, student, the, the students, obviously, are great. We actually are fortunate to have two science teachers that are in the school. And so it's, you know, it's, it's obviously not, not just me. Steven you know, came, came into you know, our, our field of view last year, which is also um, you know, super, super lucky for us. Um, but at the end of the day, what made it, made it possible and what made it happen. Um, and I think we all kind of came together and basically had this vision of, you know, uh, one thing that Steven said that stuck in my mind is, um, you know, you're, this, n these numbers become your identity, right? And I think that's something that's 
um, you know, that these, these students in 191 like live that every day. And, uh, you know, if we're gonna try to kind of break through that, I think this program, it's funny, if you're in another school, they may see programs like this as, um, you know, an amenity or a benefit. I think for our school, it's a necessity. Mm. I think it really is the key to giving these students something positive to think about aside from the test scores and the things that are kind of recurring on a year to year, you know, year, to year basis, right? So um, that was kind of the impetus. And again, we had a lot of constituents come together. We've actually, we're actually funded this year and last uh, because of a very generous grant from Helen Rosenthal, who's our city councilwoman. So again, coming out of the rezoning, there was a lot of, you know, frankly, kind of political kind of um, support as well. So it's really about kind of hurting the cats at the end of the day and kind of rallying people and getting people to focus on, um, you know, our best bet as we kind of, you know, thought it, you know, thought it would be. So, um, yeah, and, and here we are. We, we went from a five-week pilot last year, which again, we worked really closely with uh, Stephen and his team to, to implement. Um, last year was focused on little bits. This year, we're actually doing uh, two eight-week sessions, so a fall and a spring session. And this year, the big focus is Scratch, which I think is awesome. Uh, and we're actually, you know, again, Stephen, you know, leading the charge, but we're, we're teaching to third graders, seventh graders, and eighth graders. So kind of pretty broad age, age range. And um, the really cool thing is we had our first session yesterday and uh, you know I Stephen was there in person so he might be able to give a better recap of it but when I hear that the, the kids just loved it. It was pretty awesome yeah seven sections of, of kids all day long went through and uh, even with a fire drill thrown in there and uh, okay. yeah they they uh, each of them got into Scratch and created a game and started started on their journey to learn coding and the design cycle process. So you know the last thing I'll say um, is we're really fortunate again to have all these people, including Stephen, um, at this here and at this place and in this point of time. And you know we're really hopeful that programs like this will help a lot of these kids who are struggling, the families that are struggling, kind of break out of some of these cycles. And actually, to your question earlier, in terms of you know addressing parents that might be thinking of different tracks or different schools, um, part of this is for the parents too, frankly, right? To have us kind of break out of our own kind of mindsets where we don't necessarily just look to the school that has the 99th percentile. I think you know there's kind of bigger things you know um, at stake here in terms of like can my son work with someone who comes from a different background? collaborating to create this thing that comes from a different background. And that's something I think, you know, again, everybody talks about social emotional, like that's as social and emotional as it gets, right? So, um, yeah, so we're really hopeful. Hopefully from this year we can take it, you know, next year and our science teachers can kind of carry the baton and ultimately um, uh, lead some of these classes themselves. That's, I think, the ultimate goal. And again, you know, wouldn't be able to do it without Thanks, Andrew. I, and I, I would just say, you know, right back at you, you'll notice a pattern uh, here. All these people are parents, and uh, they're not educators, and they're not experts in STEM and coding, um, but they have a passion about what's possible for kids and, uh, and a, a commitment to, 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 to see it happen. And uh, so that's really, that's really what it takes. You, again, don't need to be a teacher. You just need to have a commitment and an interest in putting this experience in front of kids. We're, we're almost done here. Um, and I won't, I won't go exhaustively through these. These are in the ebooks, the ebook that you'll get. Um, just, a few, just a few highlights here. Um, I would, if you're looking to you know, start or improve a makerspace, uh, look first at what your school needs, not what you can do to the school, but what the school needs, right? And then try to, try to address the school's needs uh, through that makerspace. Now, in most cases, the school's probably going to be pretty desperate for some hands-on student-centered learning. And one of their big goals is going to be STEM and coding. So you're in luck there. Um, attend a maker fair. You know, like I said, immerse yourself. And, and once you see it firsthand and actually do it, you know, it's, you, you, you'll be hooked. By the way, makers are, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a designated, you know, people call themselves maker and, you know, and Ben, Laura, and I are makers. We, we, we love to create. Yeah? Um, I just wanted to ask if I could show this. Oh, yeah. I would love to show that. Come bring that up while, while, we, while we move through this. Um, is, um, 
the ma makers are really, they're not new, right? These are armchair engineers and game designers and hackers and inventors. And uh, these, are, these are folks that have self-identified into the group as makers, but they're nothing more than people that are creative and they want to see change in their world and they're going to be part of that change. And Ben, I can't get this up on that screen, no, so it's cool. if you could just hold it up. Um, I don't know if everyone can see this, but um, last year, oh, hold it. thank you. Last year, um, I created this game. We were studying Egypt, ancient Egypt. So um, I created this game in Scratch and um, taught it to my entire class. We all did it in school. Um, it was really fun. Um, basically, you can just click on enter the maze. You can go to a maze, and you can um, use the WASD to control and try to get to the gold. And if you click on raw information, he is um, an ancient Egyptian god. He can. Um, I, there's just some information about that. And we have a little back button. You, have, you get some points you can get in the maze. And um, I have tons of other stuff that I've created on my account. And um, I, didn't, I didn't know about Scratch until Maker State, and I really like it now. And I'm so <laughs> glad I learned about it. Oh, dude, and thanks I, for the plug. Yeah, I, 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 just, <laughs> I, I, do, I, do it, I do it a lot after school. Um, and I love to just create new things and well, he's got business cards. That, uh, his, his title is uh, a playtest director. So he's a guinea pig. Everything, thank you, buddy. Everything that, he, uh, everything that we do uh, as an education program, he, he does it first. And so thanks, Ben. And uh, there, you know, that goes back to your question. Um, you know, and that's a huge, huge topic is, you know, it's the practicality of what do you do with these two schools that are spitting distance from each other and one of them is, you know, serving families that are in poverty, and another one is literally like one of the best elementary schools in the world. And how do you reconcile that, you know? And uh, well, you put the kids in charge, right? That's scary, but uh, for a lot of people, but it doesn't have to be. Um, uh, you know, I'd, I'd seek some resources that are out there. They're in that ebook. Get involved in your school, and that could be just the PTA or whatever it is, or a community organization that's doing this. We're working through a lot of community organizations that have nothing to do with the school. Um, host a pop-up. I can't emphasize that, because once people see it and get a taste of it, they're going to want more. And I, I kind of often characterize Maker State as a Trojan horse. You know, they're not going to let me in at 10 a.m. or 1 p.m. or whatever all the time. But they might let me in at 3.30 after, after the last bell rings. Our parent might give me one week over to summer. And once we put that type of experience in front of a kid and the parent sees the impact on that child, we're in. And the hope is, is that that child will grow up and, and, and at some point they may say, go sit in that row and take those notes and memorize those facts to take this test and the kid is going to say, no, that's not the way I learn. So if we're not going to decide to get there as adults together, hopefully we can get the kids to, to make us do it. Uh, I would host a design challenge. There's, there's a couple of them on our website, a scratch design challenge and a Minecraft design challenge. Get the kids creating something in a, in a, in a creative, competitive way. Uh, it's really personal best competitive. Uh, set up a STEAM team or inventors club at your own school. You can look on our website about how to do that. Um, Andrew knows this one. You know, when it comes down to it, Andrew is the type of guy who uh, most parents will say, hey, I want this to happen to my kid. So I'm going to be involved with their teacher or this after school program on Thursday or whatever. Andrew wants the whole school. And he's not going to stop until the whole school has this experience, right? And what he has said is it's not just about PS191. As he was saying, he said this, he wants PS191 to be a beacon for how kids can learn everywhere, right? But the, one of the things that if you really want to take a big, big swing and do it fast and efficiently, find some money. And because that, that is, you're doing it at the whole school at a time like Andrew is, and that, that's really helpful. Um, even, and sometimes that's just a little grant, you know, even $1,000 can help, help the program along. Um, and meet with your school leaders. We have a document in the ebook and on our website about making the, making the case for a maker state, uh, maker space. Um, and then finally, what do we got here? Um, offer to help, you know, 
sometimes uh, the best way to get something is to give something. You know, so when you go in the door and you've got this idea that you want something to happen and da da da, and I tell you a lot of times I march in and I've got an agenda and I want to, I want this school to have a maker space, you know, and uh, but if I just take a step back and take a breath and be like, hey, what do what do you all need, you know, what's going on here, and what goals and vision do you have for your children, and almost inevitably they will dovetail with what we've talked about tonight. Um, we're back to Seymour Papert here on the last slide. Um, uh, Papert, you know, he was an advocate of kids learning coding, but what he was really an advocate for was kids taking charge. Kids are in the driver's seat. And so when we came up with a robotic system that, not, not Maker State, but when, when, the, when ed, the education uh, experts who created um, LEGO Mindstorm's EV3 robotic system, when they came up with that system, they designed it based on the kids taking charge, the kids building, innovating, uh, making, and learning. Um, and so, you know, what we think at Maker State, and this is echo, echoing, I think, Andrew's words, you know, this is an opportunity, a tremendous opportunity for kids. And if they get this opportunity, it's going to transform, you know, their world. This is back to computational thinking, right? If then. If we give them this type of learning, their lives will be transformed and they will be empowered. And I might not even say it goes beyond an opportunity. I believe it's an obligation. It's an ob we have a debt to these children. We must give them this type of learning. And uh, that's why Maker State exists. We're one more instance among a growing number of programs around the country and around the world that are putting this out there for kids uh, to show uh, a better way forward for their learning. So thanks for uh, having uh, me tonight and uh, if we want to, you know, Andrew and I are available for any questions that you may have uh, about Makerspace STEM or coding learning, any, ask us anything that you like. We could have got it all there. And, and don't forget to, you can go to uh, the website, learn more about specific ways to start a, a, a makerspace, or and I'll be sharing that ebook. Uh, unless you have any more. Okay, great. And you can also I I brought some cards. I can I can pass those around too, and uh, just in case anybody wants to get in touch with me uh, directly about starting a makerspace or ask any questions about coding education or any of the technologies that we use. And uh, oh my, I uh, think, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, yes. Boy, what a great question. I'm sorry I didn't touch on that actually. Um, Boy, that, that, is a, that is a crux of it. You know, um, Lisa, can I pass this around? Uh, so, so, boy, it, and if you're not doing that, a lot of times it's just not going to happen. And uh, it should have been a slide at least. Um, if you saw in the video, you see the, 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 the thing that the teachers were doing in the video? What was the question? Oh, yeah. So if the, the question was, how do you integrate uh, this type of STEM and coding learning, makerspace learning, with what teachers are already doing in the classroom? Is that, was that your question? Okay. Um, and boy, that really goes to the heart of making because this an ongoing opportunity for kids because a lot of, a lot of um, uh, programs, they say, okay, we're going to teach this way and then the teachers kind of learn it. They get a little professional development training in it and then it's on to the next semester and they've forgotten it and that ends up gathering dust behind the district superintendent's head. So, oh, we did that program, but it doesn't really have an impact on kids. So if you're going back to the video, is we say, okay, we got to figure out a way to teach kids coding, and we're going to do it inside of a, a single quarter uh, or semester, um, and we're going to do it in a way that engages the kids from the first moment and that any teacher can teach. And we're going to do it also in a way that when the teachers deliver that, they're going to learn a, a mechanism and a framework for de delivering any other type of learning experience inside of what we just taught them. So that would be movement, arts, and coding. That's just one of the units that we teach, that we created and that we teach. So the kids learn all kinds of movement arts, hip hop, ballet, yoga, capoeira, parkour, mime. And so they're learning the fundamental movements of all these movement arts. And 
and then they, they take pictures and videos of themselves and then code themselves into games and interactive quizzes in scratch coding, right? So it's hands-on, it's out of your seat, it's up and learning. You say, okay, well, well, I'm a science teacher or I'm an English teacher and that doesn't really relate to what I'm doing. So here's the sort of secret sauce of that unit and a bunch of other things that we teach is inside of that unit is a framework for taking out movement arts and putting in whatever your topic is. So are you teaching history or English composition or algebra or whatever it is? Well, you can take out the movement part and put in math formulas or, you know, the causes of the Civil War or, or some science lab activities and the kids can code that. And the hope is, and I, you know, we believe that it's a little bit controversial, but we believe coding is the second language of the 21st century. And it, it is the universal language by which all humans can communicate, right? And so, you know, like Laura speaks French, you know, fluently, and I love to hear her speak French, but, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, don't tell her French, but not that many people speak French, you know? Um, compared to like the s billions population of the entire world. What all people use and are affected by and can create with is computer programming. And so if we can get kids to you know, speak that language and teachers to teach with it, they can teach anything else they teach through that. And Scratch is a great example. Tinkercad is another one. You can design something in CAD and bring it to life in 3D printed. Uh, uh, object, then that's just a one more way to do it. Uh, digital movies. Um, and a lot of the things we use, we use the hero's journey. Anybody ever heard of the hero's journey? So, you know, it was Luke Skywalker or Katniss or Harry Potter or whoever it is, is, you know, they were confronted by a problem in the little world in which they existed and they ran away. They didn't want to address the problem, but somehow they were sucked into it and they're off on a journey where they have to confront bigger and bigger challenges and they're defeated and knocked down. Maybe they meet, meet a mentor who shows them a way. Maybe they get a special object that helps to, to give them a power. And then they finally meet with the, fi the final confrontation and they defeat that, that, that villain which embodies the change that they want to see in the world. And that's the hero's journey and we teach kids to create those stories. But here's the fun thing about it is they're not creating some abstract story for a game or a digital movie or a, or a rocket project or whatever it is. They, we ask them to start with their strengths and weaknesses and they're writing themselves into the story. They are the heroes of their story. Now, if in that, in the, so, so like I said, it's the, you know, ultimately it's not about STEM encoding. It's about you know, a framework by which we ask kids to learn, through which we ask kids to learn. Um, Anybody else? I had a question. Yeah. So, and this may date me. Um, so, as you were talking, two different things came to mind. One is the free school movement, and the other is the original version of Lucy Calkins' Writer's Workshop. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, as, as an educator yourself, have you looked at the I mean, you're doing clearly STEM and Writer's Workshop is writing and free school movement is, is ancient, well not ancient, but it's, it's everything, right? It's, oh, it's, yes. It's completely free, but it's this idea, if you go back to, I think it was your, what was it? The autonomy, mastery, and purpose, like that's the core of that movement too. And I'm wondering, do you draw from either of those programs when you think about how you're doing this? Absolutely. You know, well, what a great question. I mean, this, this is a question I just love to sit around and talk about for hours, and, I, and I, I won't go on and on about it, but I will say this, is if you're looking at like, um, like Jungian psychology, it says that there are, some, there are some ideas that exist in all of us, perhaps even from birth. And where do we get these things from? And maybe it's even in our DNA, right? Or maybe somehow the culture, the society gives those things to us. And so I don't, I don't think that the maker movement didn't come up with these things and certainly CS for all or, you know, they, they didn't come up with these things. These are things, whether it was Calkins or like uh, uh, Dewey, you know, who said, you know, uh, you know action is learning. The, 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 the process of democracy is a learning exercise, you know, so just humans coming together and creating things. And the more you put, like in the free school, uh, the more you put the kid in charge of what's going on in that classroom, and not only that, but what's, how the school is structured and how it makes decisions, and even outside the classroom, how it will 
how it will manage recess and, and what the, the humans in that building will eat. And the more decision-making power you can give kids, you know, the more powerful that learning experience. And it all goes back to what am I asking my kids to do right now, right? So if you walk down the average uh, uh, school classroom, and I'll, I'll, I'll just wager that this was what most of our schools look like. And you, know, and you look down into every, you look into every door of every classroom, you walk down that random school hallway, and who's doing the talking in that room? It's probably gonna be the teacher. Who's doing the acting in that room? It's probably gonna be the teacher in so many cases. But we're saying the, 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 the litmus for us, the test for us is when you look into that room, are the kids doing the talking and the acting and the doing? That's, that, that's, that is it for us, so it's, and this goes back to, you know, like the, the writer's workshop would be, uh, I mean, I think that that's very akin to what we were talking about regarding the, the butterfly, right? It's, uh, very much so, that, that yeah, iterative process. Yeah, iterative design, and, 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 and it's, a, it's an empowerment thing too because it's not like I'm turning in and I'm done, it's more like I'm gonna do this thing until I'm good at it. And by the way, when you become good at it, you love it. And uh, that's what we see as a possible future for, for, for children. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks, Lisa. Thank you.